Any last words, Jackie? Blow it out your ass, pinhead. Welcome to In Defense Of, making the case for overlooked, forgotten or derided movies in five minutes or less. If you don't have five minutes, here's five seconds. Don't look now, Cub. But your family's dead. <laughs> Today, In Defense Of. House 3, The Horror Show. 1989's violent anomaly in the underappreciated House franchise. <laughs> but you know, not all women were born to be barmaids. Take my wife and disembowel her, please. <laughs> when serial killer Max Jenke is put to death for the murders of over 100 people, he makes a promise to the cop who caught him. He's coming back. Targeting Detective Lucas's family from beyond the grave, Max is worse in death than he ever was alive. Luckily, a young professor seems to know what's going on and has an idea on how to stop him. You know that phenomenon that occurs when two very similar films are released at the same time? Well in the late 80s there were two films about killers who came back from the dead after perishing in the electric chair. And then there were two more. And another two. And then another one. Probably more, but these are the ones I've heard of. Now I've only actually seen four of these. I don't much care for Shocker, and First Power is good stuff with its killer who can jump everywhere. but I can't really pick a favourite between Prison and House 3. I only have Prison on Blu-ray though, and I don't have a Blu-ray ripper, so here's House 3. House 3, the horror show, or just the horror show if you're in the States, more on that later, is a grisly little shocker where practical effects are the stars. And by golly, do we get a buffet of grossness. Body parts in blenders, popping eyeballs, exploding heads, twisted turkeys, a baby from hell. The execution scene where Max refuses to die is worth the price of admission alone. House 3 is not an amazing film, but this imagery is stomach-churning and plenty weird for it to be memorable and stand out from the pack. That's not really a surprise when our director is Jim Isaac. He spent the bulk of his career making ghastly creatures and effects for the king of body horror, David Cronenberg. The inimitable Lance Henriksen as his usual brooding, charismatic self. While Brian James really goes for it here as Max, adding a serious physical menace while wisecracking through every scene. <laughs> Apparently this was his favourite role of all time, and don't forget, he was in Blade Runner. High praise indeed. We also get the adorable Dee Dee Pfeiffer, she's the cheaper Pfeiffer sister, but the one more likely to have a shower scene, as well as Nog from Star Trek Deep Space Nine doing this. The first two House films are grand little flicks, and they did good business at the box office. They're basically horror movies for kids, not too scary, and with plenty of cool-looking creatures. House 3 is not for kids. From its opening scene, it's a far more serious, visceral, bloody movie, with more in common with slasher films of the day than its franchise forebears. That must have been a little confusing for fans expecting more of the same. And as other atypical entries in horror franchises show, deviating from the norm too much can seriously alienate your fan base. Especially as this film isn't even called House 3 in America. Sean Cunningham had already sold the rights to an as yet unmade House 3 in Europe, but North American distributors, perhaps sensing the shift in tone from the script, decided to market it in the States as simply the horror show. Is it worse to alienate fans of a franchise, or to not capitalise on a built-in audience at all? It's possible they did both here. Despite the excellent effects sequences, not a lot happens in between. We spend the bulk of the film's running time waiting for gory payoffs. Nothing really happens at all for the first 9 minutes, then we get a solid 15 minutes of the good stuff. Then it's another half an hour before our next highlight appears and by that point we're already halfway through the film. All this dead space makes House 3 feel like it's missing out on its potential. There's a lot more that could have been done with a villain like Max and his supernatural abilities. Although I suppose with six other electric chair movies the concept was explored to its limits elsewhere. Oh my god. I thought you were... Dead? A Nightmare on Elm Street. If it wasn't an entry in the House franchise, the horror show feels like an attempt to start a Freddy style series complete with wisecracking supernatural villain. Which, strangely enough, is exactly what a Nightmare on Elm Street director Wes Craven tried with fellow electric chair horror shocker a year later. It failed, obviously. <coughs> All that did was give me a hard on. The House franchise as a whole needs more love, but especially House 3. A definite highlight of the late 80s wave of electric chair movies, House 3 marries the killer from beyond the grave story with more interesting imagery and stomach churning effects than others in this short-lived niche.
House 3 director James Isaac didn't direct for more than a decade after House 3, but when he did, it was another atypical entry in a horror franchise. Jason X, or Friday the 13th in space. Sean Cunningham, responsible for the Friday the 13th movies, is also behind the House series, so maybe that's how Isaac got jobs on both franchises. There's also a House 4, just to make things even more confusing in America. House 4 is not worth watching apart from this bit. Don't forget to eat your favorite pizza, man. <laughs> That's Kane Hodder, by the way, more commonly known as Jason in Friday the 13th, part 7 to 10. Get a job with Sean Cunningham, get a job for life.